Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngelman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Thank you so much for checking out my show, where we have philosophical conversations about the economic, cultural, and psychological implications of Bitcoin. Please make sure that you're subscribed to the Bitcoin Matrix. And if you're watching this on YouTube, smash that like button so that more people see it and put those notifications on so you don't miss out on any fresh and dope content. This episode with Robert Malka about nihilism, existentialism, artificial intelligence, beauty, and Bitcoin is brought to you by River. Buy and mine Bitcoin with 100% full reserve custody and zero fees on recurring orders. River doesn't use or lend your Bitcoin. Unlock the possibilities of this revolutionary digital asset with River. Securely buy $10 to $1 million of Bitcoin in minutes. The world is grasping the importance of decentralized money with limited supply. Your friends and family could use your help realizing it. River's referral program will add $20 in free Bitcoin to both of your accounts. For those interested in stacking with a Bitcoin-only company, check out River. To get started and find out for yourself, use the link in the show notes and get $20 free when you buy Bitcoin at River.com or on the River app. There's no better time than now to get your sats off your exchange. My favorite hardware wallet is the cold card from CoinKite, and it's definitely worth learning how to use it. CoinKite is a leader in security and hardware manufacturer established block 141,000 maker of some of the most iconic Bitcoin products, such as OpenDime, ColdCard, SatsCard, TapSigner, SatsChip, the Block Clock, and the Micro Block Clock, which are really dope Bitcoin data display units. Use the link in the show notes for 5% off your order. Don't trust, verify. TikTok, next block, an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped. Join your fellow Bitcoiners in Miami Beach for the biggest annual celebration of Bitcoin in the world. Don't miss out. 150 plus speakers, 15,000 plus attendees. Miami Beach, May 18th to 20th. Get access to the Bitcoin conference with options from general admission, industry day VIP, or student passes. To get 10% off your ticket, and help support me and the show, use the code MATRIX. And now, let's enter the Bitcoin Matrix with Robert Malka for one of the most philosophically and intellectually stimulating conversations that I've ever had on this show. And I hope you enjoy this rip as much as I did. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Robert Malka is a researcher, philosopher, and Bitcoiner. He's obsessed with creating cultures that promise to develop beautiful human beings. His life goal is taking him everywhere. He's currently building a stealth education startup He's leading the charge on developing a responsible AI framework as part of the AI Future Lab, which he's a co-founder of. He's been a co-founder of Malka Communications, which provides interpreting services for the deaf in the U.S., Canada, and the Middle East, where he's also a lead trainer on interpreter ethics. He's also explored the U.S. and Canada through 10,000 miles of train riding to write a book on the experience of being a CODA or child of deaf adults. Previously, he's been a sign language interpreter in every situation imaginable for Elon Musk at Tesla board meetings and for Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook, among others. In his spare time, he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu, paintball, and swing dancing, and he's also on the board of the Bitcoin Today Coalition. He's on the team of My First Bitcoin, designing the first official certification program for El Salvador. Robert Malka, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me, Cedric. I'm doing great. Uh, you know, what's what's one of the things that's interesting is uh, I was having a conversation with Alex Vetsky 
a couple months back. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure if it was pre, during, or post, or all three, but he's like, you got to talk to Robert Malka. And uh, so I zoomed over recently, and I got to hear you on his podcast, which was uh, really fascinating. And and I've been reading your work on your website, uh, specifically Abridged Understanding or the Life of a Coda, a Child of a Deaf uh, Adult. I, I, I never actually heard that phrase before, Coda, or if I had, maybe I, I've forgotten it already. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how codas are different, and then maybe we can get into some of your background and, and upbringing, I guess. Sure. Well, first, I, I owe Svetsky a lot, you know, tons of thanks to Alex for thinking of me. Um, his, you know, doing those talks on his podcast was um, it was a blast, and, and he's, a, he's a tremendous host. Um, uh, regarding, yeah, regarding being a coda, um, the term has come into greater popularity since that movie came out also named Coda. And it, you know, it stars Marley Matlin, who was, you know, the first Oscar, uh, first deaf actress to win an Oscar, or first deaf actor in general to win an Oscar. And it tries to detail. I mean, I don't find, frankly, the movie, I think the script has a lot to be desired. There's a lot of work that needed to be done on it, but it does focus on and, and bring to life the experience of somebody who has two deaf parents and is attempting to navigate the deaf world and the hearing world. And it's a very, a lot of people say it's a unique childhood. I think, I think there are elements of it that are unique. And there are also elements where I found over and over again, that the child of someone who has foreign parents can understand mm. what I've lived almost as well as I have, you know, as, as I can explain it rather. And even there's even some similarity between uh, kids who have alcoholic parents, which I think is a very interesting and unusual comparison. But there's something to this idea that you have one life at home and society doesn't necessarily understand that life or look well upon that life, depending on how old a coda you are, right? There was a time when you were made fun of for having deaf parents and surely you'd have been pitied for it. And in the same way, you might have been pitied or uh, bullied for having alcoholic parents, for all I know. And in that sense, they're actually not so different. So it's it's navigating very different, you know, these these two very different worlds. And often you're being the parent to your parents in that sense, I think. Someone with alcoholic parents can understand that too, right? How often you have to be there for your parents, be on the ball for them. What uh, alcohol might do to you in terms of your perception of your parents um, in that sense, obviously we deviate very much, uh, deaf parents can be alcoholic <laughs> and uh, alcoholic people can be hearing, but deafness is a kind of deafness doesn't always force sign language upon kids, right? Some deaf people don't have sign language as their primary language. They use English or their, you know, whatever spoken primary language there is. But when in my case, there was sign language as a primary language, and my parents were also both immigrants. So my biological father is from England. Uh, so English remained his primary. And uh, my mother is originally from Morocco. And so they spoke different languages. So that ended up meaning that I was there for my mom a lot. Uh, I had to, I had to support her because she, it's very hard for a deaf person to learn English if you don't already speak it. And in general, it's very hard for deaf people to learn spoken language because sign languages are, you know, much, they, they're much easier in the sense that for a deaf person, that is to say, they don't require uh, a non-working ear. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's, coming in for her and being there for her was a really tremendous responsibility. I would say that it wasn't easy, but there were parts of the experience that were rewarding and parts of it that were very difficult. Uh, and we can go into that. Sure. One of the, well, right in the beginning, it was very striking, just communicating early on, I guess, with your mother. And I guess there was a bit of a struggle for you at first to to get her attention i mean what seemed like a really young age eight months old or something and uh can you describe that situation and how you did learn to communicate uh, better with her sure it's a fun story so the idea is 
I'm on my high chair. This is the story you're talking about, right? Me in the high chair. And uh, I'm, I have some food in front of me and I'm trying to get her attention. She's over washing some dishes in the sink, taking a second while I'm eating. And I call out for her. She doesn't hear me. And so I take that as rejection. And so I take the food and I put it over my head right in a kind of fury. <laughs> and she turns around, she sees the mess, and then she realizes she has to explain to me that there's actually, that she never heard me, that it wasn't a question of being neglectful, but just of, of just being incapable. And so she took two pans, you know, a, a pot and a wooden spatula, and she banged the spatula against the pot, and she just explained that they, that had no effect, that she wasn't able to hear it. And so even in my first few months, uh, goes the story in my first eight months of, of being alive, I was able to recognize that she was communicating that this strategy of mine was not going to work and that I would have to approach her. So there would, there would have to be other ways, right? I'd have to wave. I would have to, um, crawl or eventually walk up to her and pull on her, uh, shirt or pant leg, whatever it was that I could reach. And in that way we could communicate. And sure enough, as time went on, I saw a consecutive responsiveness, you know, uh, consistent responsiveness to touch or uh, sight, but never to hearing. So I think a lot of every coda has that kind of that moment. They also have the inverse fear, which I think is very funny and very interesting, which is that your parents have actually been lying to you the whole time and they can hear quite well. And there's some there's some comedy in that. I haven't really gone into why I think codas feel that way but there is some kind of interest in this idea that it's all a sort of elaborate lie and that your parents are actually not as different as they purport to be and that somehow you're the center of this cosmic joke i still kind of lost in thought about why that might be but i've seen it over and over again so there there must be some something there the the universe almost wants us to believe in our own uh, the, the reward of our narcissism or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure that our vanity is really, is really essential. Yeah. It almost seems like there's two sides to that coin where the, the child might also, I think it was a reference in the book uh, in the essay where I'm not sure if it was you referencing to yourself or, or just this could happen where the child will uh, unplug the vacuum cleaner and, and the parent doesn't know it for a bit. And, so I think that probably builds some belief or faith that the parent is telling the truth. If you believe that prank's going to work or, you know, um, that you really got him. And I'm sure that's, that was probably done in, in maybe anger and not just jest sometimes. Um, in ter what's the, what, what I found interesting as well was uh, you get a little bit into the outcomes for CODAs and those don't seem to be good. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I wrote that essay at a time when I was exploring, chatting with a lot of CODAs. That essay ended up reaching a lot of CODAs and a number of them ended up sharing their stories with me. And that was very touching for me. I would say that in general, it seems to me that most CODAs somehow adjust one way or the other. But I've encountered what seemed to be a disproportionate number of CODAs who really struggle in some way as a result of this experience. Uh, I've met ex-felons, I've met drug abusers, I've seen, I've seen kids struggle with a lot, and that's even with sometimes earnest parents, uh, very parents who really care about their kids. There's some inextricable thing that I can't get to the bottom of where, I mean, I, I suppose it, it's contextual. In some cases, thinking back, some of it has to do with this feeling that society rejected your parents, and that's very hard. So it's really where the coda ends up feeling their most home at, or they choose to feel most home at. So if they're home with their families, they'll tend to prefer to sign. I've met these, yeah, I've met those codas who almost call sign language their their primary language over English, and they have they have primarily deaf friends and hang out with them when they can. And those people are end up one way. And I'm I'm not quite sure I can summarize what way that is, but 
their world seems to be much smaller, right? They hang out with the hearing community more reluctantly. They keep their world very, we'll just say deaf, culturally deaf. And this is again, for people who are using sign language as their primary language. And then there's the other side of it, which is people who really want nothing to do with that world, right? They don't want to become a sign language interpreter. They have no interest in it. Their sign language is actually quite poor. That does exist. And they branch off into the world. And some of those people, they could go out anyway, right? They can branch out into any direction. And some of them have estranged relations with their parents. Some of them reluctantly support their parents into their old age. It, and some of them are very happy with their parents, but just decided to go do a different thing. I guess I... I was saying in the essay at the time that it seems like CODAs end up doing worse than the general population. And I, if, if that thesis is true, although I've never seen a study on it and I only have anecdotal evidence, it would be because of the stressors of being the parent to your parents and not having the language to describe what that pressure really entails, which is to say you could be doing some very difficult, um, you could be doing some very difficult interpreting assignments. You could be spending a lot of time trying to pay down electric bills, or you could be, I've heard stories of interpreting uh, somebody's abortion. So uh, one person I know had to interpret um, the abortion of her half-sister. Um, her, I think it was her dad's girlfriend, you know, just no longer wanted the baby or something like that. So you can imagine that these are incredibly traumatic and difficult events uh, to deal with. And especially if you're the one who's facilitating them, it's hard to recover from that. Yeah, I, I would. I want to explore more of this subject interpretation. Um, I'd like to read a little bit from your piece and then, so how much would you know about your universe? How different might you be if your parents taught you little your school frustrated you and you had little spontaneous access to the outside world. This is the world my mom was born and raised into. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about her experience to kind of shed light on, you know, what a deaf person has to sort of contend with uh, when the situation is not the most suitable to help them with their needs or their interpretation of the world. Yeah. So deaf, deaf people are, there are really two options for a deaf person, right? One is to be born into and deal with a mainstream school, so a regular high school, which means having sign language interpreters or not. Uh, you may just read lips or have a cochlear implant, and uh, that's one way. The other way is to be raised in a deaf school, like grow up in a deaf school. Those are small. Uh, they're getting, I suppose, somewhat rarer because most people do cochlear implants these days. But what ends up happening either way is that you're going to miss out on random information that you can get. So think think about think about how much information you get from your ears, right? So if you're somebody who's just sitting in a coffee shop and you have a 360 view, yeah, I mean your ears give you a 360 view of your surroundings. They tell you what's going on behind you, they tell you what's going on outside of your peripheral vision, and they also allow you to access conversations passively without really having to engage. So if somebody next to you is saying, "God, I just really wish I could find a person with these skills, like this skill set." That could be the door that opens you up to a new opportunity, right? I happen to have that skill set. Let me just tell them I'm the one that has it and I'll apply for that job. And one day you end up somewhere on the corporate ladder and that conversation changed your life. Deaf people are denied that kind of spontaneity and that kind of opportunity most of the time or much of the time. I wouldn't say most. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the numbers are on that again, but that's certainly the world uh, my mom was born into. There, she doesn't have a cochlear implant, obviously, and and back when she was you know born, uh, they didn't they didn't really have uh, effective implants or anything like that. So her exposure to the world was just what she could see, and then in terms of communication, it was only only what she could lip read or anyone who spoke to her directly. So if you only had conversations with people who could speak to you directly or who are willing to speak to you directly, you would lose ninety plus percent of your opportunity, particularly if you say, lived in a world where only people only spoke Italian, but you speak, I don't know, Turkish or French. So if you only speak that language, you may have access in theory to passive conversation, but because you don't understand a word, you're totally lost. So that's that child will be raised very differently or have a very different view of the world. Um, 
And they also have no idea what they don't know. They don't know what they've missed out on. They don't know about all the random factoids, cultural icons. They can only look at those things when they have intention to look for them. So, you know, instead of hearing about Marilyn Monroe because she's the cool person on the block, you would have to see her on a show or you would have to look her up on Wikipedia. So that's that really changes the shape of your knowledge base and your and how you see your surroundings. That's that's I would say that's very hard or maybe the hardest part about deafness. Sure. And then I, interpretation that was sort of external, but what about parent to parent? Uh, how does the child sometimes have to act as interpreter there? In, in my case, that was never an issue, but it's a great question. There are people who have, say, both, you know, one hearing parent and one deaf parent, and maybe the hearing parent actually doesn't sign that much. It does happen. And so they kind of, they communicate as best they can. It's a, it's a very interesting problem. And uh, some people remain frustrated by limited communication for a long time. Sometimes a parent will have to interpret for the other parent when they go out at parties. Can you imagine never being switched off, right? The only time you kind of have an intimate moment with them is when you're with deaf friends or you guys are just by yourself. But if you're with hearing family or hearing friends and they don't know sign language, you're just the interpreter or the facilitator or even worse, your kid is the facilitator. There are certainly stories of a dad who say is divorced from his wife and he takes his son or he takes his daughter. I mean, there are all kinds of permutations of the story, but he goes and he tries to flirt with hearing women and then he uses his kid to flirt with them, for example. And that's a very, you know, I don't know. It doesn't sound great to me. <laughs> I've never been subject to that, but you can imagine sort of the your parents' intention and how messy that would make you feel. Um, I've been I've been sort of subjected to it the other way around where a hearing person is trying to flirt with uh, my mom, for example, in a very gross way. And then that, I had to be the facilitator of that in some way. That's very disturbing. So you can only imagine if it's the parent initiating how that changes something or, or sort of how any of that would go. So, I, I, you know, the, the kid being involved it's like, you know, I guess I would say there are just some things that kids should probably not know about or shouldn't engage with in a certain way until they're older. And even then, you almost want some distance between you and your parents in certain things, right? It's just cleaner that way. It's nicer that way to to have certain distance. And that degree of formality is what makes them your parents. Uh, that sort of hard boundary that there are certain lines a kid never crosses. And so unfortunately, I think that those circumstances force kids to break those boundaries or force parents to break those boundaries for their kids. And I don't want to take agency away from anybody. I think there are certain things that just feel very wrong and they feel wrong for a reason. And so they are, and, or they're distasteful or they're indecent. And so, you know, where the fault on that lies is circumstantial, depends on the particular circumstance, but I would really, I'd really try to refrain from ever blaming the the kids for that just sometimes it's what they have to do and that's it's certainly a shame yeah <clears throat> what about i mean I, i'm fascinated by this notion of um the interpreter sort of has to uh, embody who they're speaking for and it seems like there's multi-facets to that uh maybe in the temporary short-term sense you uh, you might have to embody like a stranger so both sides of the conversation and, and whereas um maybe over a longer period of time you maybe embody the person you interpret for on a long-term basis uh could you talk to speak to that a little bit sure so i say something like interpreting can very much be acting and the trouble if you're interpreting when you're young is that you're you don't have a clear sense of self that you can separate from what it is that you're doing. So if you're a kid, you'll say something like, um, I identify with these people, right? In some way, they're also me. You can, it, it's kind of hard to say while you're, while you're growing and taking the world in what exactly is you and what exactly is not, what you should emulate and what you shouldn't. 
And often parents come in and they tell you what to emulate and what not to emulate. And that's easy because parents, family, very close friends of your parents and so on are authority figures when you're young. And when you trust in them over the world at large, then that becomes fairly clear. How you should behave in the world is fairly clear. But when you're a kid and you're interpreting for people who seem to know more than your parents and who seem to take a dominant role in in an interaction because your parents are lagging in what they know, then it's actually confusing who it is that you're supposed to emulate and how that works. Do I emulate my parents or do I emulate these hearing people? I'm not my parents and I don't have the voice of my parents and I don't have the same disposition as my parents. So do I emulate the people they're talking to who I'm interpreting for or do I interpret and emulate uh, them? And I think just to go back to this, every child of immigrants has a very similar experience in that way. Do I interpret do I embody or emulate what is Mexican in my Mexican parents, or do I embody or emulate what is American in, in the Americans around me? And, the, you know, there used to be a very clear answer to that question culturally, right? Everyone tried to be an American in these days, culture has sort of taken a different route and it's be who you want to be, uh, be, be the figure at home. And I find that to be a very interesting you know, it's just an interesting result. It's an interesting question. I, I don't, um, I don't think it's worth taking any position on that here. But it's just worth being mindful of of which direction we want to go in as a society. And in my context, in particular, uh, you know, my parents very much wanted to be Americans. They they really had a vision for that, and yet there was still this kind of inexplicable border between what it is that made them, de them deaf, obviously, and the limits of, of being able to access hearing society, right? There is a final line. And so they got closer to emulating or borrowing from pieces of the deaf American world instead, which is still a different subculture, right? It's still something that's, that's not <laughs> the same as hearing American culture, uh, whatever that is, right? Whatever we, we decide the bounds of that are. So as a kid, I'm, taking in different people, their mannerisms, and you kind of have to, you know, when you're older, you're actually no longer sure what's what and where you sit and all of that. And you can almost wear masks all of the time. You can borrow from this person's gestures or this person's behaviors, and you sort of try to put your, yourself together as best you can. It's often not very easy and it's not very clear. It certainly wasn't for me. I had a lot of trouble being able to figure out what was fundamental to me and what wasn't. And I think once upon a time, those questions were actually much clearer for people. It was very obvious what you were, what you weren't, what what gestures were appropriate, what behavior was appropriate. In a postmodern world, it seems as if people are saying something like every behavior is of equal value, which seems outrageous to me. I don't really know if that's quite true. I don't think anyone really believes that. If anybody espouses lip service to that, they don't really mean it. And it's quite dishonest, but there is certainly a kind of behavioral soup, as it were, from which people can just pick random traits or attitudes. And I was born in a very intense version of that cauldron where everybody was different. And I had to, I had to literally emulate what was being said and behave in such a way that was reflective of how they behaved or what they were trying to say, express what they were trying to say, even if I ferociously disagreed with it or disliked it. And then I had to try to figure out after that where I sat in that framing, in that picture. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a bit confounding. I want to read a little bit uh, more. So you wrote, I notice hearing people have this intuitive, hard to reconcile feeling about deafness. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Can you say more? What's the line after that? <laughs> or If you're not go? hearing the world, if you're not logged into it, you somehow can't take space in it. We want to imagine that the silence one experiences is also the silence one expresses. Right. So <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So that's, yeah, we have this idea, hearing people in general have this thought that if you're deaf, you're, it's, as I said in, in the essay, that you're not taking space within it. So deaf people have a quiet home. 
is a very common myth. Uh, deaf people are very loud. They often have a very loud home. The reason why is because when you can engage with something, that is to say, when you have working ears and you can engage with sound, you also know what its boundaries are. You know, not to slam things unless you're angry. And even then, a lot of people consider that distasteful, right? So if you're deaf, you have no engagement with sound. And so you don't know what makes noise and what doesn't and what way it makes noise and what way it doesn't, what's irritating to somebody like nails on a chalkboard and what isn't. And so you're very loud. So your senses actually give you, what senses give you is not is not simply, or maybe not even at all, infinite access to some data in the world, some sensory data in the world. They give you a sort of feedback loop. They allow you to stand up right in it. They give you the limits of the world. And that's a very different and essential distinction. So you're able to know what is too much and know what is too little because of your senses, not in spite of them. And so I think being human has always been about redefining limits, right? What exactly does good mean? What exactly does evil mean? If there even is such a thing as evil. Um, and then what is power? Power itself is up to interpretation. And similarly, right, what are human limits? Are there any? Uh, that is itself up for interpretation, the question or idea of limits. Modernity, of course, says that man is unlimited, right? It's a fundamentally Rousseauian ideal that man is infinitely malleable. And it seems to me that this is, I know, something that you wanted to jump into, and we don't have to jump into it anytime soon, but Nietzsche seems to me to say something like, man is malleable only over an infinitely long <laughs> length of time, right? He's not infinitely malleable in 50 years or 30 years. You can't make boys girls. You can't make girls boys. You can't, uh, I mean, there are hard limits, and I realize that that's fairly confidential, be, you, co excuse me, confidential, uh, controversial to say these days. Um, but th there are hard limits on our biology, but perhaps over a long enough period of time, some very interesting things can happen, right, with enough willpower. And there's a, an interesting sociological or historical anecdote to back this up, which is that I think it was Plutarch who said something like, when he went to Greece, he saw how beautiful the boys were, ancient Greece. And he said that their beauty only came about because of how hard their ancestors had worked to make men particularly beautiful. And similarly, if you go to, I don't know, Salt Lake City, Utah, you can see just how especially beautiful the women there are. And there is a specific intention and intentionality to make women beautiful in a very specific context. And so their descendants inherit inherit the um, the rewards of that generation's long effort. And so the question for Nietzsche really is something like, what could we do with 300 years, right? Not one generation, not three, but let's say 10. What could you do to human beings over 10 generations? Right. So what discipline, what will could be applied? And um, I don't know if I want to go into the specifics of of that. I think there, there are a lot of difficult questions and answers going that way. But this is all to say that um, that that these, you know, the senses and, and the hard limits that we have are, are a good start. Right. Like, let's just say biology is a decent start to any question. And the the loss of certain senses, I don't know if it improves, you know, I don't know what basis we have, what methodology we could use to figure out whether deaf people are more sharp in one sense or four senses versus another. Perhaps, perhaps there's a way in which a deaf person could set about, given their lack of ear, working ears, could set about a, a tremendous intention to improve their eyesight in a certain way. I don't, I don't know in what way, right? We would have to ask. We would have to hope that that person has within them the will to even come up with an idea like, I'm going to use my eyes in this way, in a way that's never been thought of before, in a way that it iterates or improves on on how how I can see seeing or how I can work with seeing. I mean, that's, you know, it's a question that's sort of, it's not really something I've ever thought about until now, but um but but that's that's that right so so if you're if you're living in this modern world what what exactly is worthwhile to you and and how we take up space i mean those are all those are all um i think compelling philosophical questions that have come about from my experience with 
deafness and and listening yeah listening to what can't be heard yeah well, there's, a, there's a lot there well let's jump into a little bit into Nietzsche um I mean maybe I'd ask you a question he might have asked himself uh, wh- why do you live are you asking me that question yeah why do I live um well I certainly didn't choose it so so in that sense there is no why I, I didn't choose it. I was, I was given it. And so that's that. I guess what I, what I think about often is something like, why, why is it important that I live or why is it important that I try to be who I am? And it's something like, there are certain, I don't, I mean, today it doesn't seem to me that life is it doesn't seem to me that life is very exciting. Actually, we live in a civilization that has tried to make everything artificial and boring. And I think that is an apolitical statement. Just about everybody feels what that is or that problem. And some people like it and some people don't. I would say the vast majority of people do not. There's something very ill-tempered and disturbing about a world where everything is pre-planned and structured and um, it doesn't really lead anywhere. It's all just games where you run around in circles. There's something that's not, there's no fresh air that comes into the civilization we live in. And I would say that that could probably be summed up as nihilism, right? Where it doesn't seem there's no real feeling that there's anything meaningful. Everybody feels interchangeable. If you, you could just go to a new city. I mean, could you imagine being a Greek and being like, I'm just going to move to Japan or I'm going to move to Persia. I mean, they would laugh. It was just outrageous because the Greeks had a, had a beautiful overarching project and you would have no interest in leaving that project to go, what, like visit somebody else's, like, what do you care? You're going to go be Greek. So, so I guess, why do I live? Um, I look for the the few things that are still exciting, compelling, and and that feel real. I am looking for the those things, even if they only last a few seconds, right? Whatever, whatever moment I can get where I've pushed myself in some way, or I've been exposed to something that that gives me a reminder of what could be some some beautiful thing, right? I mean, it's really beauty that I live for. I think in the end, the there are still beautiful things out there. There are still beautiful people. And I mean that both literally and figuratively, right? Uh, beauty on the outside, beauty on the inside. There's probably some correlation there, it seems to me. And we want more of that. I want more of that. So I live hopefully to enjoy beauty and to bring more of it into the world. Maybe that's Maybe that's my answer to your question. It leads me to a lot more questions. Um, I'm curious, what is beauty? And uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I won't do too many. Yeah, I find that actually to be a very hard question. The first thing I try to say is I know it when I see it. I think everybody knows it when they see it. Your reaction to beauty is going to vary. Some people are hateful toward it, and some people are very loving of it. But I think we know it when we see it. And, you know, maybe the reason why the movie 300 was so interesting to so many people or the reason why it captivated so many people is because it took it took an artistic view of war. I mean, war is not beautiful. It doesn't seem to be by any stretch of the imagination. It's very bloody. It's ugly. You lose friends, right? You lose people you care very much about. And 300 showed that. But um, there was also something incredibly exaggerated and artistic, right? It harkened back to this world where people were biologically at their best, physically at their best. I mean, everybody looked very strong and it was believable. And it was this question of odds, right? The probability of them winning was so low. And in fact, the Spartans did not win and neither did the Athenians until later. But that, I mean, right, that seems to me to indicate something very special in terms of beauty, which is to say, 
But there is a biological basis or intuitive evolved basis for beauty. There's something in us that sees it, knows it when we see it. And the chaos of some kind is, you know, of the kind that modernity wants us or post-modernity wants us to fall into, like saying a toilet is art or something like that is, is not beautiful, but seems right to me. And it doesn't seem to be up for argument. It's, it's, it's funny because I, I think you're actually touching on something very, very deep and very compelling because beauty is sort of like love in the sense that it's not a checklist, right? It's not a logical, it's, it, it's not a series of boxes that you check. It's not, it has to have these proportions, these features. I mean, I suppose, you know, to some extent you can, you can create something beautiful by following certain proportions as it were, but we, we know intuitively that it's not a question of logic. We know intuitively that it, it's something in the world that speaks to us. And we also know that when we say that something is beautiful, that it, we're we're saying something very intimate and personal about ourselves, right? It's evaluative fundamentally. So it's both somewhat instinctual, but not really. It's not it's not purely outside of our choice. We can modify somewhat our perception of beauty or what is beautiful in the same way that we can modify our sense of taste. We can say that something was delicious as a kid and now we don't really like it much anymore. There is some give. And yet, and yet it's also, it's also almost beyond, beyond what we're asking for. It's almost beyond the asking of. Um, yeah, it's not quite something that we can just change on site. It's not something that we can demand. And it's also, it's also something we have some control over. And I, I think love is very similar in that way, right? When we choose a partner, we are saying that we love them and that says something about us, right? Our love is reflective of something in us, but it's also not a checkbox. So beauty and love, beauty and ethics, those three things are all deeply intertwined. They may even be the same thing. Love, beauty, and ethics may all be exactly the same thing. And I think Wittgenstein is the one that says aesthetics and ethics are the same, it seems to me that love is is in that category as well. Not just that love is a beautiful thing. Um, and not just that love inspires beauty and beauty inspires love, right? They they seem distinct to be distinct objects or distinct things, phenomena. In what way they're phenomena, you know, I, I still have to think about, I suppose. But but in some way they also seem like if I have double vision on a on a on a bad day, they may almost seem to be the same thing. And I think that would be philosophically uh, calamitous. It would just not be a great thing, but but I almost I almost want to group them. If not, if they're not the same thing, I almost want to say they're the same category of thing somehow. Fundamental atoms of, of power that, uh, that drive human beings into new places. Speaking of you know, fundamental, uh almost humanity when you speak of of beauty and love um it made me think so is beauty linked to morality is it related to morality in the sense of of good and, and good versus evil love not hate uh peace um are, are those linked i think that's right i think they are linked i think they are linked and i you know i Again, this is also difficult because I say again that beauty is not, you know, Nietzsche was an atheist, right? Um, for all intents and purposes, certainly an atheist. And what that means, if you don't have God in your life, there's also no objective view of anything. So it's this very dangerous high stakes game whereby there are there is clearly some grounding for things like beauty. It's not a totally relativist. A lot of people get this wrong, right? They think if you have no God, there's just relativism. Everything is equal to everything else. Well, that's not right. I mean, we just talked about biology as being the basis of things and that we do have some stuff that's hardwired into us. I mean, if you remove God, what you you end up having a, a very serious danger, which is the Rousseauian danger that people believing that we're infinitely malleable and that is wrong and that gives way to relative relativism. But I try to say something like Nietzsche is a perspectivist. 
That is to say, some perspectives are clearly better than others, but they might not actually win in the fight of becoming a dominant interpretation in the world. And that's really what Nietzsche is all about, um, just to tie it to him. His interest is in finding a way to get better interpretations of the world, of human beings, of themselves, to win in the fight against lesser interpretations. And, you know, lesser interpretations are ones that will just say, bring about ugliness, or try to invert values such that ugliness is actually beauty and beauty is actually ugliness. And we have to understand when there is a lack of a God that that is actually quite possible, that ugly things can beat beauty, they can win. And if they do, that's the world we're going to live in, period. Does that mean that ugliness is better than beauty? No. But if that becomes the dominant interpretation, beautiful things will become rarer. There is a high stakes game at play here. And in the end, whether you believe in God or not, you are still going to have to play by the rules of that game now. We live in a world that demands that you play by the rules of that game. You can't simply say God will win. Well, I don't know in what way God wins without human beings to do things. So God doesn't just come in from the sky or come in from wherever he does, right? It doesn't seem to me that there's any evidence for that or that that's a helpful interpretation, which is not to say that God doesn't exist or that believing in God is useless or that people don't feel a certain way when they believe, right? Those are all those are all things, right? It's true that you feel a certain way when you have an unbudgeable faith. And it's true that, you know, God means a lot of things to a lot of people that are, that often result in good things. But the reality is that you have a world in which if people do nothing, beauty can be snuffed out. And in fact, I, it seems to me, even if this is not theologically true or possible or relevant, that God himself could be snuffed out and that Zeus and Hera have been snuffed out. There's no reason why we should say that any God couldn't be snuffed out, even if he's the one God that all other, you know, that you, you know, before which you may have no other gods in your presence. So, so, so Nietzsche saw that whole situation coming. He saw the 21st century coming. He saw this conflict coming. And in the end, we needed, he, he realized that we needed the tools to be able to have dominant interpretations or interpretations that deserve space in the world to win. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask you then another sort of Nietzsche question is why do you suffer? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a, I, I'll try to try to see if I can be helpful with that question. So um, one of the things I, I think we should bear in mind is that whenever we ask a question, we also ask implicitly, why is it important? And that's a very important question. So why do I live? Why is that important? Why do I suffer? Why is that important? Um, everything, you know, why, why is truth important, right? What is truth? Why is it important? What is justice? Why is it important? We have to be able to answer those questions without assuming that there's actually a good answer at the end of it, or even an answer that benefits us. So um, Nietzsche has a lot of thoughts on suffering. He says toward the end of his days, he expresses that he wishes upon all those he cares about as many difficulties as possible because he believed that the only thing that was worthwhile was to prove that you could endure them. And so I think Nietzsche would say something like, why do we suffer to harden us? right? To make us capable of certain interpretive cruelties, not physical cruelties, right? His goal is not to be kicking dogs. That's the opposite of what he's interested in. That seems to me to imply, right? Kicking dogs implies an, an inability to digest what was hard for you, right? You have to take it out on somebody else or something else. Whereas somebody who's very capable of enduring sees no need to exert that resentment in back into the world in such a way, right? If you are so immensely strong that you're able to digest what is hard, you're going to behave, I would say in general, you'd behave very decently toward the world, right? That seems like a reasonable thing to say, but more than that, you would actually be able to know how to express your response to wrongs done you in ways that are actually meaningful and productive for the world and for you. 
So I don't believe that Jesus has turned the other cheek is very helpful. Seems to me that that's, it's almost inhuman, right? To just take more abuse. I, I just can't believe that that's a righteous response or a helpful response. Um, and that's, that's, by the way, it seems to me that that's what makes Jesus so special. It's what makes Christ such an interesting figure is that he essentially did inhuman things and he bore them with such tremendous strength. And that includes his dying on the cross um, to believe that dying on the cross will redeem all of mankind. That's quite an original idea. And that's very powerful. And that's very, I mean, how many of us could do it? Nietzsche jokes that, and it's, it's a, it's a meaningful joke, right? That there was only ever one Christian and he died on the cross. I think there's something to that. So why do I suffer? I, perhaps I would say something like, I don't know yet. And I don't, I don't know what, what the limits are of human suffering in general, but perhaps they could be much higher than we we allow. We've gotten very lazy here in the West. So maybe it will be to our advantage to increase that a little bit and forget about comfort, right? We've gotten too comfortable. Um, but it's easy to say that when I'm sitting in a chair, chatting on a podcast, engaging comfortably. Um, maybe let's check back in when things are harder. You know, yeah, it's interesting. We, we are both sitting, I'm sitting in a comfortable chair. Uh, and I, I uh, against Pierre Richard's witches, I, I own more than one chair. I haven't sold them all. Uh, but, you know, in life, I, th I agree with you, is not incredibly beautiful. It may be, well, I, I, the world is beautiful, but I think everyday life lacks some beauty in post-modernity. What is a beautiful life? Yeah, that's not an easy question. And I don't, I think it would be wrong of me to try to give an answer to that. It seems to me that it's not just a question of existentialism, right? It is what you make of it. But there probably are many, many good answers to what makes a beautiful life and even answers that we've never thought of yet. I think there's still a whole vast you know, there are so many islands out there full of, you know, new possibilities that we haven't even ventured out towards yet. But I, I would love to see answers to that question as we go. And that's not me trying to dodge it. That's me saying I haven't necessarily thought of my own. I'm still sort of in what I consider to be the dark ages of the West. And I would like for us to try to push through that and see, see what comes after. We're just we just need pioneers again. We need uh, we need people who are willing to take guesses at that question. Sure. And what do you think about maybe how do we instill this idea of beauty in maybe the next generation? And I don't mean necessarily their their physical beauty as individuals, but do I do I take my children to the beach for a beautiful sunset? You know, a lot, a lot in the world today is, you know, you, you work maybe like a soul sucking job, uh, you know, as a spreadsheet jockey or you, you're doing something that, you, you know, that maybe is not fulfilling for the world or you don't feel fulfilled by. But, you know, in your spare time, what 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 can you do to, you know, without maybe going to Disney World and spending ten thousand dollars on what might not be very beautiful in the end? Um you know, how do, how do you maybe show them beauty without just spending money? What, what do you do with, with time? Right. Well, I mean, that's that's where Bitcoin is useful, right? It helps those of us who um, would love to accumulate capital in an honest way and not have our savings drained, right? It gives us the chance to accumulate meaningful capital and then to use it later on projects that are worthwhile. And then, you know, in the end, you can live like the Native Americans in theory. I don't know how many would do that today, but you can live like Native Americans in theory and you would get, you would still, I think, live a wonderful life if you were able to live in Yosemite from birth to death, right? That's quite an incredible environment to live and die in. Dying under the trees like that in summer or winter is a pretty um, fine death <laughs> insofar as death can be fine, right? But um but I think insofar as we live in cities, we have to look at what makes a city beautiful. So maybe we start there, right? So 
in the end, Nietzsche was interested in talking to individuals, people who are willing to break free of this Leviathan and go out on their own and experiment, right? Make their whole lives experiments, turn them into art, turn them into something that would be understandable to others, right? People who are willing to toil away in silence for years or decades so that they could come up with a new answer to what is a beautiful life or what is living and why does it matter or why should we live and why does it matter? And when you really tackle that question with your whole being, and that's the only thing that you do, right? You forego a traditional career, you forego marriage, just to answer that question, you have to be a very specific kind of individual to be able to do something like that. And Nietzsche was interested in speaking to those people specifically, and he wanted to give them that option because the city will never give you an option that doesn't benefit it. That's a very, right? The city is a very dangerous thing. So it's good for the vast, vast majority of us. If you're listening to this podcast, right, you're probably in the camp where, and there's nothing wrong with it, you're probably in the camp where we'd rather live in the city than go be on our own for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But what we can do is look out for those people who actually would prefer to live in this kind of unorthodox way and give them permission to do so give them the ability to go be free or even give them the space to be free, right? In a surveillance state where every corner of the earth is taken, I think it's very hard for somebody to find their space and not be watched and to be ridiculous and outrageous and and to dance the way they know how to dance, right? So, so that's another thing we can do, right? We can help open up spaces for these people. So that's that's one answer. The second answer is, insofar as we live in a city, how do we make it beautiful? Well, there's the obvious, I think, answer that we, we've we forgotten, which is architecture. We've forgotten beautiful buildings. I mean, I, you know, in the 70s and 60s and 70s, we destroyed those buildings on purpose. Uh, and if you look at pictures from the 1890s or the 1930s, and then you look at pictures in the 1970s, you'll see that city halls used to look very beautiful and San Francisco looked quite majestic. And it's almost unbelievable. The pictures are unidentifiable. You wouldn't even know what city you were looking at. If you look at St. Louis, Chicago, San Francisco, Chicago was once called the White City. Doesn't look like that now, but that's what it was called. We had a, a real serious emphasis on neoclassical architecture at one point in the United States. Europe was bombed to smithereens in World War II. And so people can actually spend their whole lives having no damn idea what a beautiful building looks like. Everything looks like box architecture. So one of the things we could do is fight for that again, or even fight to have that skill set again. I would bet that we don't actually know how to create moldings anymore for buildings. That's a serious problem. And we don't know how to um, build sculptures. And lest we think that we already have that stuff down on lock, there are cultures and peoples who designed art that we still don't, you know, we still don't quite know how they, you know, we don't know how they did it. It's not obvious to us. So there's a whole field of innovation in the space, not just farm science, not just tree science, not just, you know, just even the fundamentals. Like, how do we do, how do we pick up giant bricks the size of what's on the pyramids and build the pyramids again? Like, how would we do that if we really wanted to? What does that look like? And do it without cranes. Or did they have cranes? You know, at this point, I'm willing to believe anything regarding that question. So, so that... That's one, right? Architectural, or, I mean, I think we live in a world where there's architectural terrorism and there's good reason why. If you can't ground kids in something that's more beautiful than they can imagine that inspires them to build toward it, you're just gonna have kids on, the, on their phones all the time. And there is an upper limit to how beautiful a screen can be, right? And even if you live in the metaverse, kids will always have this intuitive sense that it's not real and they'll always have, they'll always be stuck in this, um, if their body is withering because they're on, they have something on their face the whole day, um, they they will know that they can't be beautiful. They'll know that there's a limit to them. So you want to take them away from those things and you want to re-engage them in the world. And you want to try to have them have friends who they can be bored out of their minds with and then say, well, let's go build something. I think that's a beautiful thing, right? Fraternity, friendship, sorority. Um, those are those are beautiful things. Um and then of course, you know, you said the beach, that makes perfect sense to me, right? Being in nature. So a sense of, it seems to me that sovereignty, a sense of agency, fraternity, sorority, um, living in a beautiful place where things are, things are all the time beautiful and people are invested in beautiful outcomes for their, for their space. Uh, those, those things matter a lot. And 
well, you can see that in Japan. I mean, I'll just say one last thing about that, which is that the Japanese are still very, very good at that. And down to the point where they'll even clean up a foreign land if they're in it. So if you looked at the World Cup, there are the Japanese for every round that their team was in, you know, was playing, they cleaned up all of the trash in the stadium at the end of it. They literally went through the entire stadium. They picked up all the trash and they left. And when they were asked why, they said, the Japanese never leave a place dirty. And that's a shocking statement because there is no other culture that quite does something like that. But they they refuse to be affiliated with uncleanliness. Well, that's an idea, right? And if the Japanese never existed, someone could have come up with that and said, what if I could build a world in which to start, one of the tenants was, we would never allow a place to be unclean, even if it wasn't ours. And that's just to start to get you thinking about cultures as if you're an alien. When you look at them, what are the good parts? What are the bad, quote unquote, bad parts? And are you sure they're bad, right? In what way is something good? In what way is something bad? To the Japanese, things that aren't Japanese are probably bad, right? I mean, they're, they're seeing it from a Japanese lens, and but that's very meaningful. So can you wear a Japanese hat um, as a sign language interpreter might've had to, right? Just wear it like an alien and watch them go. And can you wear a Qatari hat? And can you wear an American hat? And can you wear an Argentinian hat? And can you wear hats that haven't been worn yet? I guess as we're spiraling into this question, I'm hoping that the the clarity of the of Nietzsche's project or even our project is our project in general, humanity starts to come into focus. Yeah. Do you think Nietzsche would be a Bitcoiner today? I don't think he would place much importance on Bitcoin. I think he would see it as a very light tool as a modest little tool, I don't think he would see it as a huge thing. I think for him, economics is not the base of a cultural superstructure. And that's what I try to tell Bitcoiners all the time. Don't make Bitcoin your life in such a way that you end up buying into Marx's fundamental argument, which is that economy builds culture, builds politics. That's wrong. It's not right. Right? Economics in some way infuses with culture, but culture comes from great men of chance, great men of genius who come about and decide that the world has to be a certain way. Bitcoin is not gonna save you from nihilism, right? The blocks being mined and chained to previous blocks is not gonna save us from nihilism. That alone is not reason for us to want to live. But what it does do is it opens the door to modern corruptions being sidelined. It doesn't end them but it gives us the door to open to open a newer world that's more decentralized if we choose, which is what we want. And it also stops inflationary tendencies, which I like very much, right? So it stops people from, or it makes it much harder for people to commit endless fraud and, um, you know, sell their bodies because that's the fastest way to make money and they have no thoughts about family, right? So whether you like OnlyFans or not, the reason why people are doing it is because they don't they don't see they don't see very far into the future. What they see is a whole ton of money that they're able to make. And the reason why that money is being spent in the way it is is because there are too many dollars flush in the economy. It seems to me that if we had much fewer dollars and um you couldn't inflate them and every hour that you worked was a meaningful hour so that on Monday, you worked eight hours, and on Tuesday, it was still worth eight hours rather than the seven hours because of inflation that it's now worth. You would start to have a longer, right, lower time preference and a lower inclination to behave stupidly over this next month. You would be able to envision your children having a future and your children's children having a future, and those things wouldn't really be able to be taken away from you the way gold was taken away from us or the way governments might want to seize your land for some reason or other. It also makes taxation harder, right? Which circumscribes the size of a state. So I, th I think that's a very good thing, right? Instead of having an endless Leviathan that can print infinite amount of money and build unlimited amounts of destructive capital, it forces states to reprioritize their endless largesse and to say instead, let's just focus on a couple of things and let's do them well, which I think in the end, that's the kind of state we're probably going to have. It's not going to be anarchist. We're not going to be fully localized, even if many of us want to be. We may be able to open up to a world where we are partly localized, and that's great. Um, 
I still think the global, you know, global, local sort of world is going to manifest itself in some way. But I also think, you know, here's here's a paradox that I think a lot of Bitcoiners don't think about. Most Bitcoiners are libertarian, libertarian, and I I think that actually a more decentralized economic solution like Bitcoin is probably going to bring about more monarchy, more top-down authority, and it's going to be more centralized and more meaningful. And because those monarchs will not be able to print an unlimited amount of money from, from the mint, they will have to behave differently, right? They can't, they can't be a Leviathan. They're going to know that they have to give people space. And paradoxically, right, being a single centralized authority like a monarch and maybe balanced with a parliament selected a certain way also gives greater accountability. You can isolate it on one person rather than um, this endless bureaucratic monster that we have in the modern world that we call the nation state. So I think Bitcoiners should probably look out for that. The, you know, the party of Nuevas Ideas is centralizing power all in Nayib Bukele for a reason. And I think similarly, the Gulf states, relatively speaking, are doing quite well for a reason. And while not every example of a monarchy or a uh, a tyranny. I mean, I guess, it, you know, though I find those to be different things, but not every every power in which, every, you know, it's centralized in one figure or one body is necessarily good. You can see that you can see that democracy in general doesn't seem to be working very well, even if the propor pro pro proponents of democracy would like you to believe that they are. I think that's a very controversial statement. And I but I guess I, I guess I, I get the impression that democracies are gradually turning to tyrannies, and I think everyone gets that sense. And that's precisely what Plato warned about in the Republic: that you start as an aristocracy, such as the founding fathers, and you end in a tyranny, eventually a one-party state. So maybe Bitcoin gives us the opening to get out of that faster, which is good because if we didn't have it, I would say we had certainly no hope of getting out of it, and. Um, because of technology, the way technology goes and the imbalance of power just a few people can have on other people, that we'd probably be at the bottom of that political wheel for a thousand years, right? We'd probably be stuck in an endless tyranny with no way out for a very long time. Yeah, yeah, all that. I, I get that. And I mean, especially uh, sort of uh, in the beginning, what you were saying there, I think, you know, Bitcoin defends, uh, gives, helps me defend myself from a lot of those external forces. And it, it kind of relieved me from the Red Queen's race of, of inflation uh, and, and sort of lifestyle creep. And, and that kind of gave me hope because I could, you know, maximize myself and my production and, and my time for the benefit of me and my family. Uh, and also I could take back a lot of time because I could focus on just Bitcoin in the, in, the, in the way of like stacking sats instead of becoming uh, an economic scientist and genius. Uh, studying several markets and politics and the you know where it's going and the the tea leaves um but you know i like this idea of of humanity as a multi-generational process what is a genius a genius is somebody with an extraordinary amount of will it has nothing to do with innate talent um and if you could look at if you could count the number of geniuses who apparently had no innate talent at the thing they became genius at, you know, you would you would be you would be surprised to find that it's probably ninety nine percent of geniuses were not born with any innate talent and in being a violin or a political leader. It's will, it's vitality. Geniuses always have a disproportionately high amount of vitality relative to the population. That's what makes them so scary. They're endless. They're endless machines. They go they go on and on. And they're infinitely adaptable and they're infinitely curious. So when you look at Julius Caesar, it's not that he was so good at politicking that blows you away. It was how many things he was able to do at once and how well he was able to do them. But that only came about because he was never able to pause, right? He never needed to pause. He had this kind of ability to outwit himself and his own drives, and he had he had mastered himself. He had true self mastery, and he had from the tensions that were in him, he had all these places that he could go, all of these things that he could do with his energy, 
and he knew how to properly apply them. So the problem with the modern world is not that we lack geniuses. They're everywhere. There are probably more geniuses today than there have ever been. The problem is that they're told to criminalize those instincts and they collapse in on themselves. People who are extremely sensitive, like geniuses are, need to be given a space in order to dominate in the way that they need to dominate. That is to say, if you are interested as a genius, if you have an intuition for being a violinist, you need to be taken to a place where you can thrive in that way naturally. And you need to be around people who can support you in that rather than put you down. So we have this Prussian schooling system whose goal is to completely destroy vitality, curiosity, and the instinct to succeed. And so far, you know, again, definition of success is up for debate, but let's just say that we know in layman's terms what success is. Well, whatever it is, their goal is to subvert it, right? I think just about all of us has an experience we can point back to when we were young where authorities put us down or our peers put us down and we weren't they weren't stopped from doing so in such a way that the world made sense to us. And then I think many of us were sensitive enough to dislike school and to find it silly, the idea that you had to raise your hand to go to the bathroom or you had to follow somebody else's pace in learning. Nobody has ever had to do something like that ever, right? When a kid was curious in the past, they went and they got they they got engaged with things that kept them curious. So they went and they looked at leaves and they drew them and they went and they made observations and they, you know, whatever it is, whatever directed activities society had, they had places to put those, that to put that energy. And then they were able to create from that, from that cultural basis. So um, that's, you know, that's what genius is. And if you see kids like that, I would say something like probably geniuses are orchids, right? If they're injured while they're still growing, they almost never recover. They're crooked for the rest of their lives. But if they can be healthy from birth, you know, then they, they become very hardy, almost unstoppable. So they're, you know, the more sensitive you are, the more prone you are to fail actually. And Nietzsche says something like, the strong need to be subsidized and protected because there are so many weak. And so I don't think people often think about that, right? When we have a when we have a curriculum or when we have a budget, rather, for schools, the first thing we spend it on is those who are weakest, those who have the least. That's a very traditional, you know, 2,000-year-old instinct. But there's another way to look at it, which is, to give those who are gifted in will, not gifted within a system, right? Not gifted at test taking, but gifted with a specific type of vitality and will to give them more assets from the pie that we have rather than less. So um, I just want to give, create that suggestion for people to think about because that's an alternate view of the world. It inverts the values that we're very accustomed to. And it's worth mulling over. Is it something, is that a world that you want? Is that a world that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a very interesting question. Uh, in turn, uh, something maybe, maybe related. Uh, I want to talk about AI a bit. Um, is, is AI natural? What do you mean by natural? Uh, naturally emergent um, of the world. There are some people I'm thinking about who I wish I could get to answer this question. I think that the mathematical methods that we use for AI are natural. That is to say they're found, they're findable in the world. I think the way AI is being used is rather unnatural. And I should clarify that AI in general is a sort of buzzword and it really doesn't mean anything. What we're really talking about when we talk about AI are, um, you know, ways to make sense of data. That's really what it comes down to, right? We have computers that take in data and then we find ways to interpret that data. And sometimes we have an output that's actually interesting and meaningful. And often it's probably counterintuitive to say this, but the outputs that we've produced so far are actually not that great. I mean, we have ChatGPT, which I think a lot of people find interesting, but it's just predictive. It's just, you know, 
language prediction. It just tries to predict the next sentence and it's getting better at being able to predict a thought from a previous, you know, an overall thought, right? A sentence from a previous sentence, but in no way is that creative, um, fundamentally creative. Um, I think, I think it's imitative of the most uninteresting thing about us. Our inclination to try to predict things is not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's, I don't know if it's the most uninteresting thing actually, but I would say it's a fairly uninteresting thing all told. And one of the things that we might find more interesting again, is the question of, of will creation, um, I don't know in what way creation is predictive or predictable. If we wanted AI, which is what we call it, to go further, we would have to really break free of this tendency to predict things. Um, we'd have to go beyond. We'd have to go beyond that and think of something else or see some other means. Yeah. Do you think we'll get to a place? Will we always be programming? sort of AI and, and, and sort of this this code or will it emerge and, and start to mimic us and be able to improve itself? Yeah, I think in some ways it would be able to self-iterate or improve itself. Um, I'm trying to refrain from saying anything too outlandish here because I don't really know in what ways. I think the greater danger for AI is that eventually we're not going to know what's true and what's not true. We already have tremendous trouble with that. In order for us to be able to navigate the world, we have to know what we're receiving every day. We can't be deceived every time we take in a piece of information or we can't be unsure as to whether we're being deceived or not. When you talk with somebody, you wanna know that they're a real person. And when you rewatch a video of some thing happening in the world, whether it's good or bad, you wanna believe that it's a real video. The threat that AI or technology in general has today is that it's being used for precisely those nefarious purposes. That is to say, to make the world indistinguishable from, you know, unreality and reality indistinguishable from one another. So at this point, somebody could make a video of a riot happening somewhere in the world, but there's no riot at all. It was totally AI generated. Or a speech from somebody could be made, right? Your, your identity, Voice recognition using your identity is no longer safe, right? Somebody can quickly imitate your voice using a software and then they can get into your bank account. Somebody could pretend to be a very attractive girl on Instagram and then they could uh, <laughs> um, they could easily create a video of a fake girl sending you a fake video message and seduce you into giving them your information. Eventually, meat space, as the Grateful Dead like to call it, um, is going to be the only place left that's going to be remotely trustworthy, it seems to me. What you see with your eyes will only be believable. And you won't even be sure whether what you're receiving from your friends is real. And, you know, if you live in a totalitarian regime that's terrifying to live in, you may not even be sure your friend is still your friend between times that you've met him. It could just as easily be that a program, and this is the very dark side, right? But it could just as easily be that they were arrested by some Gestapo-like entity, and then an AI took over the account and operated as if they were them in perpetuity and continued to get confidential information from you. Um, so I think Digital identity is going to have to continue to be a kind of pseudonymous. I think Bitcoin really hit the nail on the head with that. And I don't know how we get past this technological conundrum that we have. I don't know how to fight fire with fire because what you want is truth. How, what kind of watermark do you put on something to show that you're real or to show that it's true? Um, it's not a, you know, how do you act? in a unified form if you don't actually know what's true? These are very dangerous and very difficult questions. And we have to, you know, in the end, the answer is not gonna to be to try to think your way out of these things. The answer is gonna to have to be create technical solutions that play both defensive and offensive. But if you're not thinking about these issues and you're just looking at 
how awesome chat GPT is because it can give you a meal plan and then put it into a table and then translate that table into French, you know, it, you're thinking too narrowly about the circumstances that are right, right in front of our eyes. You, you, you put out an interesting tweet thread uh, about a year ago. Uh, in the first half of the 21st century, we need three miracles to overcome the great filter, rebuild, reinvent high culture and make real meaning from nihilism. Um, I'm kind of curious where you see AI uh, and its interplay with culture and high culture. Um, how does it drive culture or will it merge with culture? One of the things I think about actually with AI is where I don't want it to be, you know, where I want its presence to be absent, for example, in education, for example, in communications between people in general, I want, I want AI not to exist in those spaces. Um, I think there's a very substantial opportunity there between AI and the interplay between technology and human beings in general. I don't quite have a good answer for you just yet in terms of how, how that should actually look or how things should actually play out. Um, in general, it seems to me technology has actually, has actually taken us away from us. What I, you know, taken us away from ourselves. What I hope is that we arrive at a place where human confidence reemerges, right? Confidence in what makes us, us, confidence in our belief to persist at something for 300 years and not to try to delegate our own beauty and our own will to something that we built. So I think, I think technology in general could be a very monumental building, as it were. If you were to call technology a building, it would probably be the greatest building we've ever produced or produced for some time. But it's not a very pretty building, and it's not really something I think we should be that proud of. Uh, I don't I don't think we've come close to using it to make human beings more interesting, more compelling, more powerful, right? We thought the internet would give us unlimited access to information so everybody would be very knowing, but instead <laughs> all we did with it was make cat videos and um and there's no there was really no systemic I mean, you know, people do pursue their interests on the internet and that's great, but I think it's very clear that our attention spans have gone down and we've used it for generally stupid purposes, right? Our vices are what show up on the internet more than our virtues. And that may be the way of the world. It may be that anything we create will be used generally for our vices more than our virtues. So maybe let's just find a way to improve our vices, make our vices more interesting, <laughs> And maybe tech can help facilitate that, right? Create more interesting vices. Maybe tech can help us um, focus on certain virtues. Uh, the internet is, again, a great example of that. Bitcoin is a good example of that. What does is, what is whatever AI is look like at the end of that? I, I, you know, I couldn't tell you. Um, I think a lot about it. What, I, what it could certainly do at the end of this is Right, it could it could imitate human beings in conversation, and if you include robotics, maybe even human action to some extent, in such a way that you might almost fail to recognize what's human and, and what's what's created by us, what's organic and what's not organic. Maybe, but if we maintain our confidence in ourselves as a race, as a species. And we say that the human pace is the right pace and the technology doesn't have to overwhelm us or, you know, we don't have to suffer in a deluge of, of tech, technical mass. Um, then I think, I think technology in the end will, will remain subservient and even perhaps somewhat peripheral to a few of us. And and that could benefit us, but I have nothing more than than to be somewhat vague in this whole process. Uh, 
you know, thinking about it. Sure. What is freedom to you? And, and do you think we have it? Boy, big questions, eh? No, it's a good question. I Freedom is going to be understood differently depending on who you are. Freedom is not one thing for everybody. Um, but maybe in layman's terms, right? A, a lot of people want to say something like freedom is the way to behave however you want right up until your fist meets the other person's face. I mean, that seems to be a fairly reasonable definition. Um, but I would actually say something like the most important element of freedom. I mean, some people, of course, would disagree with that, by the way, and they would say might makes right. And so if you <laughs> you can conquer other people, that's that's the truest freedom, right? Um, I joke with friends that we should have a society where anyone can be challenged to a duel. And then I think politicians would retire from their positions very quickly. Uh, you know, funny. But in all seriousness, um, <laughs> in all seriousness, I think I think freedom requires certain sacrifice. And what I mean by that is, Freedom is the unwillingness to let things, capital accumulation, hold you back from whatever options that you want to take. It's it's partly optionality and it's partly discipline. Freedom is the ability to commit to something for any length of time that you choose and to also have the ability to meaningfully um, come up with, discover, come up with, and 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 eventually then commit to those options. So what is freedom? Freedom to Lycurgus, the inventor of Sparta, is going to be different from your average Spartan's freedom. And that's because their vision for what their options are is going to be inherently different. And not every Spartan could have been Lycurgus. There was, in fact, only one Lycurgus for good reason. So so if you're Lycurgus, then your goal is optionality. It's not to be bound by capital accumulation, right? If you're Buddha, you escaped your, your palace. Your goal was not capital accumulation. It was the discovering of options. If you're Jesus, very similar, right? They all follow a relatively similar path. Their interest is not in wealth per se. Um, their interest is in, I would say, poverty, cheerfulness, and independence. That's uh, early Nietzsche. He talks about that in Daybreak. Um, and then what, what these people were all able to do is get others to commit. And they themselves had committed fully to this in the most disciplined way they could, right? They invested their whole lives into and sacrificed their whole lives for an idea, a set of ideas, a way of being. Um, that, it seems to me, is the meaningful freedom, not modern freedom, which is just do whatever you want. Who cares if it doesn't work? Go do something else. It's not quite so lackadaisical. I think freedom for certain people is pregnant with a lot more promise and is going to be much heavier than the kind of modern libertarian freedom that we have today. Yeah. Um, I, I can see that. Uh, I want to touch on one anecdote from the podcast with Svetsky that really stood out was uh, you mentioned that um, they put like a rat brain in a robot. Uh, why did that perturb you so much? Uh, I'm, I don't ask like, uh, it doesn't perturb me, but I just <laughs> want to hear you, your thoughts on that. Yeah, my instinct was to interrupt you and just say sadistic. <laughs> you know, it remains as disturbing to me now as it was then. So, um, well, the first thing I did was to was to be an interpreter, I suppose, and try to think, well, what's the rat's perspective of all this like? And you can imagine that you have some weird feeling that you can see things and that you can move about. And if you look at the video of this rat brain, rat brain running this robot, you can see that <clears throat> it's almost like the rat is saying, I will take some action, any action, but it's a kind of hell. It's... Imagine you have no nerves, you have no sight, but you realize you have power over something and you don't know what that is. You have no ability to articulate or communicate to the outside world that something is right or wrong with you. You remain conscious and active, but
but you're only in your own head. You're not even sure what your own head is. You can't orient yourself. You have this feeling that you're supposed to be something other than what you are, that you were actually born as something else, but you can't possibly describe what that is because you're not it. You're displaced eternally in this kind of soup, chaos. And they let that rat bot run for some time before they killed it. I don't, I mean, I think death would have been very merciful that very instant. And I think that's precisely the kind of insanity, the kind of insane direction we may end up going, which is just, let's explore and experiment with, I mean, by the way, like to me, that's, that experiment is essentially a Nazi experiment or worse, right? I mean, I just can't fathom. I, I like, it's the sort of thing that's so insane and so sadistic that it's indescribable. It, you know, you might as well tell me that you tested human temperatures, like the limit of the human body to temperature, which is what, you know, I understand the Nazis to have done medically. Um, it, it's, it's so disconnected from nature and it's so insane. Um, it's like the inversion of, Frankenstein, right? Rather than trying to make some amalgamation of human beings live, which, you know, by the way, that was a horror story, right? That was a horrifying thing for good reason. Um, you're instead taking a human thing and you're embodying it a robot and you're giving it no, no place in the world. I think we're going to see that organic matter has its upper limits in that respect. I don't believe that we'll ever be able to transplant ourselves into non-biological matter. I think we're going to find that we're trapped in our bodies and that's the end of that. And I think that will be a tremendous disappointment to these crazy experimental science, you know, quote unquote scientists. I, I don't know what to call them, but they don't deserve that title. And we're going to, we're going to find that there is just basically a limit and that what we can do is improve on our own bodies, but that's, that's not going to be a technological, there will be deep technological limits to that to our sense of existential comfort in the world. The more of ourselves we replace with machine parts, the less capable we're going to feel of actually being able to live in this world. We're going to ask for, you know, death will seem much nicer in comparison. And the same will hold true, of course, for, I don't know, I'm coming up with a random example, but taking your brain and putting it into a young body uh, that would otherwise be you. I, I think that kind of thing is also not going to work. So that's what we haven't discussed or, you know, that's what we haven't encountered yet because we're still puffing, you know, huffing on the hume of huffing on the fumes of this postmodern dream that we can be anything, but we will encounter limits to what we can be. We will encounter limits to technology and the real place where man is unlimited is biological fundamentally, right? We Still haven't quite figured out why a gorilla that eats leaves all day can lift 2,000 kilograms. I mean, that just seems insane. We don't know why that is. And we don't know why that, despite the fact that we can eat meat or anything, we can barely lift, right? What is it? The best of us can deadlift like 900 pounds, like not even remotely close, 800 pounds, whatever it is. So um, there's such a vista there's such a future out there and it, you know, forget about splicing your genetics and CRISPR, like forget about all of that. And just talking about culture as mechanism, epigenetics as mechanism, that alone is such a vista. You don't have to shortcut it. Um, and the question of why wouldn't you shortcut it? Well, because if you try to speed your way up the mountain by horse rather than by foot, you fumble when you get off the horse. The only real way to do this stuff genuinely is to have every generation work hard for it. Um, there is no shortcut. And anyone who's ever done anything in life knows that there's no shortcut to anything, really. If you pay your way into things, that's fine, but you're never going to beat the guy that worked his ass off to get there. You can get him out of the game, right? Uh, you can pretend that he didn't exist, but you're never going to beat him. So the bottom line is genetic genetic modifications are going to have endless side effects that we know nothing about. I don't care how much we experiment. I don't care how much predictive computers are 
you know, predictive algorithms are involved in the making of some solution or other. I don't care how well we come to know our genetic code because our genetic code, we, you know, we would still have to take into account what we don't know, which is to say how new genes interact or how, how new, how new combinations come together, like what that looks like or how that works. It, it's just, that's a secret that I just am skeptical life can unravel. And, you know, we were given the mechanisms to create those patterns to begin with. Culture does that. Epigenetics does that. The efforts of our time here do that. So, you know, it's just all, it's the same impulse. The impulse that people have to get past that hard work is the same impulse that we have. Like when we go up to Burger King and we just meet our order now, it's just the most stupid and egregious violation of what it is to be human. It's just gross. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is a, a void in the world, but you know, speaking of, of filling that void, you are up to a few things that I'd love to touch on before, you know, we let you go. Um, can you tell me a little bit about my first Bitcoin, the project in El Salvador? Yeah, it's a wonderful project. So I get to help design the curriculum, 10 week course on Bitcoin that's open source and free in the early days. I still help edit and uh, review it before new versions of it come out. Although Dahlia Platt is um, the really outstanding star of the show. She has created what I think is an unbelievable curriculum. It's probably, I mean, actually it's not probably, it just is the best course on curriculum or course on Bitcoin that's out there. And it's being used in multiple countries now, not just El Salvador for high schoolers and beyond, but also for countries all over the world. Every day, my first Bitcoin is getting incredible feedback and people who want help on how to put together and teach this 10-week course, translated into multiple languages and so on. So tremendous kudos. I'm helping teach this course for the first time in South Carolina. And we're doing a Bitcoin boot camp out there. Um, that's not sponsored explicitly by my first Bitcoin, although we use the the new program. Um, I can't say enough good things about the team at my first Bitcoin. They're really a tremendous group of people whose only goal is to bring Bitcoin to the masses, and we're going to do it. There's no question of that in my mind. Um, if you ever have any questions about that, please reach out to me directly, or you can find me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter is uh, RJ Malka, RJ M A L K A, or you can email me directly at uh, Robert at MalkaRobert.com. And then, is it okay if I jump into the next? Uh, do you have other follow up questions on that? Or? A couple, yeah. Oh, shoot, uh, shoot, shoot. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on Bukele. Um, I mean, I noticed you retweeted a video that I think he put out that I think Alex Stanzik tweeted and you retweeted it, but the, the most successful reduction in murder rates in a nation and perhaps history of mankind. And I'm referring to the video footage of, of all the gang members being sort of corralled and uh, taken to another place. Uh, what do you make of Bukali? What do you think of, of this particular uh, piece of, of video that we see coming out of El Salvador? Sure. Well, it's um, interesting, right? Because if you had the same video, but it was people who you thought were good, you know, everybody would be outraged and horrified. And so the question, you know, but does that mean that what Bukele is doing is wrong? I mean, it seems to me, no, right? It seems fairly obvious to say that what he's doing is the right thing. He's reduced murder rates to essentially zero. I don't think there's been a single homicide in El Salvador in eight months, something like that, or in a few months. Um, Look, it's hard to argue with that, right? If you have the sense that murder is a bad thing, and I would tend to say that it is, and if you have the sense that there's an outside force causing chaos in your country, maybe the smart thing to do really is to just go in there, take those people, arrest them, put them in this prison, and make sure that they can never get out of it. Um you know, I'm I'm not an authoritarian by nature. I realize it's a very dramatic decision to make, but we don't have the same disinclination when somebody is going through chemo and they have cancer. That is to say, 
you're you're basically firebombing your entire body with this poison and your hope is that you get rid of the cancer. This is a very measured circumscribed method to take certain people who are causing chaos in your country out of it. I think it's a good model for how to revitalize a place that you're sure is beyond fixing. El Salvador went through a civil war for many years. It's hard to believe that anybody would want more children to die, more families to be afraid, more people to be incapable of freedom of movement in their country. I think people in general who are upset about it are not upset about it for political reasons, you know, ideological reasons, that is to say, arresting people on site because they have MS-13 tattoos on their face is wrong. I don't think that's why they dislike it. I think it's shocking to many people that a place can really be cleaned up or fixed in just a few months time with the right vitality and the right effort. And we should be watching that very carefully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very complex, nuanced situation that I personally, I mean, I've, I've heard felt, uh, you know, El Salvador was, was had a brutal civil war. Uh, I've never validated or done a lot of research myself. Uh, I just heard that anecdotally and in and, and history lessons, um, I, I've heard, you know, the gangs play, uh, soccer with the heads of their enemies, uh, their, you know, and, and I, I get all that. I, I, you know, I hear the murder rate is now zero. I, I can't validate that, uh, his statistics, but, you know, a lot of anecdotal evidence of that, uh, at the same time, the video seemed extremely well polished, um, highly choreographed, you know, smartly filmed. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's like when people ask me about uh, if there's a politician I might prefer, like over another one, lesser of two evils, there's still politicians to me in this regard. Um, he's still playing politics, um, you know, releasing this footage. I felt was clear, was clearly intended for uh, not clearly, but it's an election campaign. Yeah, absolutely. it seemed intended to but it seemed also intended for external and foreign audiences just as much for internal. Um, and, uh, so that kind of struck me, uh, it, it, I was getting all warm and fuzzy about going to El Salvador. I understand he's fighting a civil war and things are a lot better, but I'm a little, maybe a touch less inclined to go. Cause I, I feel like there's a lot of power in one person's hands. And what if someone accuses me of having a tattoo on my face? Uh, you, you know, I'm walking around with BS, you know, 21 and someone's like, ah, you know, who knows, or they put a tattoo on your face and take you away. You know, it's just that it makes me think of that too. And uh, I really do think what he's doing is remarkable. I, 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 I'm trying to see it with open eyes and I've never been through a civil war. And I, I, so, but at the same time, I'm trying to note that there's always two sides to a coin and there might be a, a good end, uh, an uh, ulterior motives uh, alongside the good motives. I, I don't know. We're not even ulterior motives, but just who's the real intended audience for this. It was just very interesting. Um, that kind of brings me to the Bitcoin Today Coalition. So what are you doing there? And that's more domestic. Right. So our, I'm on the board. Uh, I'm lucky enough to be on the board of the Bitcoin Today Coalition. Our goal is to promote and enable, ensure Bitcoin, pro-Bitcoin regulatory policy, regulatory frameworks that allow the United States to be the foremost hub um, of innovation on Bitcoin in the world. We think that creates a geopolitical advantage for free countries all around the world. Um, so we've connected closely with the offices that are leading the charge on this. We redline some of their stuff and we connect deeply with people, you know, staffers, legislators on the Hill and elsewhere uh, in state legislatures as well. Um, and we connect to the political issue from all angles. So we work with um, other organizations also in the fight. We work with energy. We work with uh, regulatory bodies that are non-elected. We work with elected officials. So we're really deep in that. One of the things that we're working on now, and if this interests you, please reach out to us. We're at bitcointodaycoalition.org. We have a Bitcoiner jobs page, which is not for Bitcoiners. That is to say, it's not Bitcoiner specific jobs. It's for Bitcoiners. We are interested in jobs that are policy related, whether they're on the Hill or elsewhere. And we want 
people who are orange pilled on the inside of these offices. We want people in treasury, in the SEC. We want them in senators' offices. We want them in gubernatorial offices. We want them in congressional offices. Basically anywhere that we can have eyes and ears in the same way that the environmental movement has put green, the green people, you know, like uh, the green people has put people with green inclinations as it were everywhere. Um, we want orange people <laughs> as it were everywhere, people who are deeply orange pilled and who believe in the mission of Bitcoin. And that way we can have things, we can avoid the consequence of a Kathy Hochul signing a moratorium in New York into law ever again, right? That happened because we had no eyes on the inside of her office. She had a bunch of environmentalists making calls inside and out and pushing her to go one way. So this is a decentralized fight. Anyone can get in on it. You'll get paid to do it, right? If you believe in it, if you know someone who believes in it, you can become a representative for Lummis. Uh, her financial right hand, her right hand for finance. You can do that for any anybody for which we have an open position. And then gradually we'll build a grassroots movement that truly reflects uh, and makes us proud to be Bitcoiners. Awesome. Yeah. So we kind of did foreign domestic there and now take it to the personal level. What 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 is the red circle? Ah, uh, yeah. I don't work on that project so much these days. Um, but... I, you know, I'd very much like to. Our our goal is to um, give people the first aid kit, as it were, a psychological first aid kit to help people deal with others who are suicidal or who are really struggling with their emotional, um, just their emotional difficulties. I, you know, it's personal for me. It's something that uh, I've dealt with and I've struggled with. And um, I think there are ways to help people break out of suicidal inclinations enough to either get help or to reconnect with friends and family. And much of the time, the struggle with suicide or suicidal tendencies is because things are either far too hard for them and they need a little bit of help or they're not being understood, which is also, you know, I would say a very tremendous difficulty as we talked about early on in the podcast. So I'm very hopeful that we can I mean, we, you know, we produced a kind of workshop uh, that I thought was good uh, with the Red Circle. And there just needs to be, we, we would just love to revitalize it, um, my friends and I. Um, but it's a very cool project and it's very meaningful. And, you know, the Red Circle sort of representing the psychological side of the Red Cross. And right? so the Red Cross is to fix physical trauma and the Red Circle would hopefully be a toolkit to help you fix psychological trauma. Um, in the end, I think depression rates of suicide, they come from, they come very much from feeling disconnected, uh, from the world, feeling disconnected from people, you know, not feeling a sense of fraternity or sorority or togetherness with people you love or want to love or want to be loved by. And that's deeper than a first aid kit, but first aid kit, developing, helping spread the language to deal with things like that is a good start. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful stuff. And if you could maybe help any person in the world, see beauty, you know, beauty pill them, whether it was uh, to help them, or if you thought maybe beauty pilling this person would help others uh, mentally, who, who would it be? Oh, hell. I'll have to think on that question. I, I don't have a good answer. All right. What about if, if yeah. you could orange pill anyone in the world dead or alive? If I could orange pill anyone in the world dead or alive. I think if we could orange pill like a, a major non-controversial celebrity, that would probably be very cool. Who's like, I don't know, like Justin Michael Timberlake, Jordan. Michael Jordan. That's my like pick that. for very... For uh, sure. You know, Teflon and everyone likes him, doesn't come with a lot of baggage. Um, that's it. That's it. Exactly that kind of person. Right. And then if you, you know, if he accepted payment for Air Jordans through, you know, using Bitcoin, something. So basically, yeah, some some derivation of that, some some product like that. Um, you could also do it for uh, 
Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of any head of state that where I would say, oh, I'd really like them to try to put this into law as an executive order or something like that. But I, I can't think of anybody right off the bat that I would pick as my very first choice over someone like Michael Jordan. So you kind of have me beat. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. And, and if you could have dinner with any two people. Uh, Audrey Hepburn and... Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Audrey Hepburn and uh, Leonidas. It'd be a very interesting conversation. Why not? There you go. Yeah, uh, Rob, I've I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, one other tidbit I pulled out of uh, your show with Svetsky was how you you mentioned that the the people who are the most cold resistant in the world were Polynesians. I thought that was that's right. Fascinating. Um, I'll leave it to you for any parting words or you know maybe anything that you gleaned from that sort of uh anecdote and you know let people know where they could find you and your work yeah last thought is um the thing i love about bitcoin is how much signal there is in proportion to how much noise there is and that's maybe one of the things that being orange pilled really gives somebody if they look hard enough is that this world is like 99.9 percent .9 noise and maybe it always has been i don't know I mean, I don't think it's ever been this bad, but there's always been more noise and signal in a civilization or a society. And hopefully we can get to a world where we can just reduce, you know, raise the proportion of signal to noise respectively. That is to say more signal, less noise. And that's, you know, in the end, the most organized team wins. And Bitcoin is this wonderful phenomenon that lets us meaningfully organize in a decentralized way lets us commit resources without necessarily committing time right there's something automated about it and it's in its free market um, approach and i don't know if culture quite works that way but i think we can we can help get our footing again through through technology like bitcoin and i'm incredibly hopeful for a world where we slowly shed the noise and start to think in terms that are generational, right? Really be able to sort of like a radio signal to aliens, send signals straight into the future that's meaningful and that, that can last us. Not necessarily forever, because nothing is forever, but long enough to give us hope and to do something really beautiful, even if it's a flower that only lives a day, as it were. It doesn't mean the flower didn't live or that it wasn't worth, uh, it, was, it didn't have that valuable moment, so. Um, that's it. In terms of finding me, I mentioned uh, Twitter, so RJ Malka. Um, uh, I tend to enjoy email, so um, Robert at MalkaRobert.com is a great email, so at Robert at M-A-L-K-A-R-O-B-E-R-T.com. Or if you want to reach out to me for Bitcoin-related reasons, um, the best one is Robert at BitcoinTodayCoalition.org, spelled exactly as you would think. And um, always really hope to connect. Thanks for listening. Thanks for yeah. having me on, Cedric. Yeah. Really. This moment has been tremendous. Thank you so much, Robert. Yo, thank you for listening. Please make sure that you're subscribed to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast so you don't miss out on any fresh and new content. I want to thank Robert Malka for taking the time to come on the show. I also want to thank our sponsors, River and CoinKite, for powering the show. If you're digging the chat, all I ask is that you leave a five-star review wherever you dome your podcast, because that's the best way to spread the word so I can keep grinding out thought-provoking conversations about Bitcoin. Keep learning, keep stacking, and stay laser-focused out there. This is Cedric. Peace.